welcome back my nature loving friends thank you so much for tuning in to this episode we are going to feed the ranas and talk about the ranas and more about ranas what i thought about doing is by a suggestion by the way of one of the subscribers uh we'll talk about how to piranha <laughs> i'm going to do some sort of i don't know not, not sure not necessarily a playlist but a sequence of few uh, videos like a volume that will explain better or perhaps give you a perspective on how to keep piranhas the natural way, the way I do it. Uh, obviously that involves the, you know, different sort of um, uh, mechanics or, or, or methods as I call it, but they're all based on natural order. And in order <laughs> to better illustrate, to better explain, I figure we'll break it out to a different, you know, sort of segments, explaining what is what and how, if you should uh, find yourself interested in keeping piranhas. So stay tuned, my friends. We'll talk about some piranhas. <laughs> All right, so here it is, my friends. I have my uh, healthy helpers. Always part of my videos, as you have noticed, they've been, you know, a huge part of my, my lifestyle and this channel. Uh, also representers, representatives of biologically most appropriate raw feeding. So, as I was saying, um, let's talk about the piranhas a little bit and their background. I'm now going to give you a full breakdown of what and how, but just what I understand and what helps me become a better fish keeper or piranha keeper in this sense. Okay, you guys, calm down because I'm getting too distracted. Okay, so we'll start with the fact that they do uh, come from tetra family. So piranhas are like other tetras. They may exhibit similar, similar characteristics as other tetras. Therefore, if you are thinking about, you know, adding uh, tank mates to piranhas, which often helps them to, you know, break out of their shy sort of shell, uh, gain a little more confidence and so forth by just relying on their tank mates. So what I would say is look into tetras or research a little bit more about same type of fish from the same, uh, say, uh, body of waters geographically. Therefore, you'll be able to perhaps you know, create a more hospitable, more balanced environment for your piranhas. And as far as the balanced environment, my friends, you have probably noticed that they are very active, always coming up here. You know, they're used to my presence. They're used to the lighting, the traffic, you know, sort of uh, the lifestyle that I, you know, bring in in this, in this area, which happens to be now their, their world, <laughs> more or less. This fish tank is their world. They haven't been anywhere outside of it. They don't know what nature really looks like or anything, but I have brought as much as nature as I could for them as they're biologically innate or genetically are designed to live in such way, in such waters and feed in such, uh, you know, in, in such sequence and everything else. So yeah, that's, that's what you have to do, my friends. You've got to educate yourself and find out what is the best, most appropriate biological way of them reliving their lives whether it's in the tank or anywhere else so that's a good start my friends I don't want to you know blabber too much about the biology but it is crucial it is uh, you know a foundation to this entire process just to understand the biophysics the chemistry that goes on you know in the fish tank whether it's uh, metaphysics guys metaphysical or if it is just psychological there is a whole lot of you know, that goes into a peaceful, or I should say balanced, <laughs> there's nothing peaceful about it, uh, balanced life for these, you know, for this type of fish. Uh, red belly, as you can see, there's a, this is a tank full of rescues, by the way, so there's two different groups put together. Don't know their ages, really. Uh, they, they look like juveniles because they were small, but they haven't grown much since. And uh, as you notice, the adults, which I'll, I'll feature in a minute, they have grown from three quarter inch to you know eight inches and they probably will grow some more once I move them to the larger enclosure we'll, we'll hope that you know this may happen here as well but they have uh, were able to you know organize themselves into this pack of maybe uh, one or two leaders within the pack uh, that that can collaborate and sustain a healthy you know sort of um, organization you know the, the organization the pack like mentality uh, comes to play when they start to hunt or when they are being hunted, not when their life is hunky-dory, blessed pellets are dropping in the water and so forth. You will not notice those dynamics unless you provide them with the natural full spectrum lifestyle, which includes life feedings, hunting, scavenging, and other things, including the part where 
uh, you know, they have to sort of mitigate who is the leader in the pack. All right, well, similarly, the adults, oh, there's some loose plants already floating around. I'm gonna have to attend to <laughs> before this feeding takes place. But similarly to the juveniles, the adults also have uh, a pack mentality, have organized their pack, they have structured their pack, and they do have their leader. Um, there's only 10 individuals, so it's a little bit easier perhaps, even though they are larger, it's easier to sort of collaborate with fewer members than a larger pack. That's why there may be several alpha members in a large group of 100 or so, you know, we never know. I would think they would break up into these battalions <laughs> within the, you know, squadron. So, yeah, uh, uh, again, the approach to creating most natural habitat for them it, it creates a lot of natural barriers like you see you can see I've implemented a lot of driftwood and plants and so but all natural decor in order to break up the you know uh, uh, the terrain so to speak their space provide natural barriers where they can call their own as you can see this guy always down there below just fanning his little bed you know that he makes now occasionally or she uh, and then there's again this this sort of like uh, you know ability for them to traverse through the tank without bumping into each other which helps even though this tank is 220 gallon i think it's too small i think they could easily use a 1200 gallon <laughs> uh enclosure and that's what we're in the process of building right now so as i was saying earlier the process of acclimation and everything else is definitely something that you yourself are going to have to work on you can expect the fish to behave a certain way if this is not something they're used to and uh, you will not know how to reciprocate it either. What I mean by that is when you approach a tank and you start doing, you know, some gesture, uh, uh, sporadic gestures or, you know, quick jittery moves, um, yeah, you could expect them to freak out, to kind of, you know, overreact, whatever, swim off, crash into things. That's what they will do. They'll show the intimidation. The fear factor is definitely built in them. And it's part of their preservation when, you know, some kind of big predator like a caiman or a big bird or a snake or whatever approaches the, the pack. They're not only going to lose members, but in pack, you know, in the large numbers, they, they obviously seek refuge as well as using those large numbers to overpower, overcome larger prey. Much larger prey than, than say, cichlid could, which is only capable of, you know, gobbling up whatever fits in the mouth. These guys can literally bite off you know, chunks from whether it's a small piece of fish or just a fin nipping as they are in a stage of fin nipping when they are young, all the way to taking down a buffalo or your own cow that wanders into the water or something like that, or even a human being. And obviously there's probably records of all type of things happening, but that's not what this tutorial is about. What I wanted to basically bring out to your attention first and foremost, occupy your, your uh, some part of your time while you're preparing and building your tank with researching what is, you know, these characteristics of the fish or the region they come from. Even though these, like I said before, were captive bred, meaning they were born in a tank, they've never seen out, you know, nature out in the Amazon. They are genetically designed uh, to basically live out this type of life. You know, we've mentioned before that you wouldn't, you know, feed your animal the wrong type of food because it ca could cause harm. Uh, let's just say, you know, an, an animal forced to feed on whatever drops in the tank doesn't have a choice to go out and hunt. As you often point out, this is nature, the prey has no chance to escape, which is a complete nonsense because you have to include me as the part of the nature, part of the pack. I have actually captured, hunted down a specimen, now I'm sharing it with the pack. I'm sharing the experience of hunt and everything else with them. So the logic behind it is kind of obscured, but if you understand that it takes, you know, a a certain amount of energy, deploy a certain amount of energy to create something, um, that energy cannot be wasted, it's just being transferred to something else, you know. So, yeah, again, physics, uh, biology, chemistry, that's probably what you should be aiming for when trying to research and discover as much as there is of the actual factual truth about the species itself, not so much of someone's opinion or, uh, you know, some sort of misguided, oftentimes misguided, you know, misrepresentation of uh, animal keeping, which I often call <laughs> industrial pet care, where, you know, you just kind of do what everybody else does. So, 
Hey, did you guys hear about the truckers heading to Canada? Yeah, me neither. Anyway, just wanted to let you know, today's uh, episode has been sponsored by Master Mad, Master Safety. And yeah, they're, they're basically there for the truckers, truck business, truck and anything with basic transportation. There's a whole lot of uh, things that get involved as far as, you know, the bureaucratic uh, layers. They will take care of everything. I mean, from CDLs, from, you know, tickets and all kinds of drug consortiums, you know, even your lug books. So you can rely on them. And I gotta say, we appreciate everything you guys do. So, <laughs> yeah. See you inside. So, you never know on the road, right? If you should need anything for your trucking business, please log into www Master Safety or Master Med as they are a partnership for any of your trucking needs. And don't forget to mention Bearski, you get 10% off. Remember, www Master Safety slash Bearski for 10% off on all of their services. All right, my friends, I hope that's enough for jibber jabber for one episode. So, we're gonna kinda end with the, you know, lecture for this for this episode for this uh, part of the video now we're gonna move into the live feeding which is obviously again sourcing your uh food or their food from somewhere other than buying it in a store or whatnot so yeah I, i've had mentioned the prey tank and i will go over it with the specification of how to make it how to build it how to sustain it and everything else i know there's been videos made i think in uh, reference to basically my sort of lifestyle or my methods as to whether this is sustainable or not. Think of it this way, if it wasn't sustainable, you wouldn't be seeing any of these creatures out in the wild, period. There's no flakes or kibbles falling from the sky to sustain anybody other than what you're capable of sourcing, forging, defending, and so forth, the natural order <laughs> and then uh you know coming out on top or becoming somebody's food so that's basically how it goes my friends thank you again for stopping by for visiting if you are new here my name is Marek everyone calls me Bear Bearski and yet yeah, welcome to my naturalist channel don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell and any other type of things you want to head on your way out <laughs> I'll see you on the next one